everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Joanna Gross and I am thrilled to be moderating our talk today with the one and only Noah Reed. As a bit of an introduction, Noah Reed is a Toronto born actor and musician. In 2015, he was nominated for a Canadian Screen Award for Best Original Song in the feature film People Hold On. In 2016, Noah debuted his first solo album, Songs from a Broken Chair. Noah joined the cast of the Canadian hit comedy series Schitt's Creek in 2017 as Patrick, where his acoustic cover of Tina Turner's pop hit The Best cracked number three on iTunes Canada charts. Noah's second studio album, Gemini, was released in May of 2020 and hit number one on the Canadian charts. Without further ado, please welcome Noah Reed. Hi. Hi, Noah. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we wanted to talk, first of all, about your new wonderful album, Gemini, which just came out in May. Um, so first of all, can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration for the title? Why Gemini? Share a little bit with us. Sure. Well, um, I guess I was sort of looking for uh, a common denominator in, in the songs. We had gone into the studio with a, a handful of songs, I think probably about 17, and ended up with 12 and I was like, okay, what's the, what's the defining, you know, uh, thing that all of these songs have in common? Is there any common ground here? And, um, and I noticed that, you know, some, some of them were coming from a really, uh, a really sort of hopeful, joyful place and, and others were coming from a real place of like, you know, doubt, um, not knowing, yeah. um, you know, struggling and, and I was like, well, that is that sort of sums me up in a way. Like, I'm a I'm a Gemini, and I I yeah. I've never put a lot of stock into um, into astrology, but uh, I I kind of I don't know. Recently, I've been sort of noticing this tendency that I have. It's, you know, some days I feel super outgoing, other days I feel completely reclusive, and you know, this sort of tug of war between like the the darkness and the and the lightness that I sort of you know identify with and so I thought well that's interesting and then as I continued to think about it I was like you know the, in Canada in, in Toronto there used to be these things called the Gemini Awards the Gemini mm -hmm. Awards were given for um, excellence in television in Canadian television broadcasting and uh, and I was like you know they they phased the Gemini Award out I don't know probably about seven or eight years ago and now it's the canadian screen award which is right. also a beautiful thing and it's that sort of brought together film and television in canada um but as a gemini i was always sort of mad that i would never be able to win a gemini i was like <laughs> ah like i really wanted what they were these yeah. beautiful sculptures so then i thought it would be interesting and a little nod to my my dual um my dual career path as an actor and a musician to sort of you know make that the focal point of the of the album art and uh, awesome. i had my good friend miles gertler recast the the old gemini award nice um, and sort of put a, a a personal and artistic spin on it that felt a little more um i don't know unique to to my situation and that was that fantastic <laughs> so um every album i feel like has a journey or a story you kind of shared that a little is there anything else that might have been unique about the journey to this particular album that you could share with us sure well i mean the the songs on the record really sort of span a period of time um that i was i don't know it was a period of real discovery for me i think mm -hmm. um i had had the experience of of you know uh breaking through in some respect uh i'd been for years i've been going to los angeles to look for work like every canadian right. actor does i guess like every american actor does too it's <laughs> sort of a, a yearly gold rush in uh in the early months of the year that we call pilot season so i would end up in los angeles you know trying to crack into the american entertainment industry and um with you know little success uh, but eventually did get this sort of uh, this break on this show, Kevin from work in which I played Kevin. And that was sort of a, a culmination in a way of something I had been, you know, working towards trying to to get there and then getting there and sort of having that experience and living in L.A., which is a town that I have a sort of a difficult history with. My mom's from L.A. And okay. I, I just always have felt kind of weird there. I never have felt truly myself there. And and. Uh, and so I don't know, a lot of a lot of the songs are about they touch on that experience of being in Los Angeles or or 
you know, achieving some goal that wasn't actually the goal. And also during that time, I was, I was falling in love. I was, I was starting a relationship. Um, And so there's a lot of, there's, there are those sort of, you know, love songs on the, on the record too. And um, so the split between those things and trying to figure out, okay, what am I actually discovering about myself? How can I listen to myself in moments where I'm having doubts? Why am I having those doubts? Where is that trying to take me? Um, you know, I'm having this experience of, of really falling for this person and, and how can I follow that while also following this career trajectory? It, it felt like, you know, there were a lot of, uh, a, a lot of splits in this record yeah. and this sort of like fork in the road kind of thing and, sure. and trying to do both, um, you know, is always a challenge, but, uh, but I, I don't know. I think by the end of the record, I feel when I listen to it now, I'm like, okay, well, I have a pretty good sense of where I was at during that time. And, and it's interesting to look back on it now and say, okay, yeah, two things are possible. You can hold, you know, two realities at the same time. It is, it is possible to do. Yeah, that makes sense. So this album is obviously really meaningful to you and all the songs are wonderful, but is there a particular song on the album that you would call your favorite or a group of songs that you would call your favorites? I don't know. I mean, I, um, I think when we were in the, in the mixing phase of, of the record, which is, you know, where most musicians will tell you things really galvanize, it sort of comes together and, and the magic happens in the mix. Um, you know, my producer, Matt Barber, and I would be going through and, and every song would take its little turn in the driver's seat and be like, oh, no, I love, and it would be like, you know, down to one little lick or, or a, a riff or just the way that a vocal line was said or something. Was just, oh, I like that. You know, that sounds, that sounds good to me um but uh but i would say the one that kind of jumps out to me now most is underwater yeah um you know we had uh in the studio i think underwater was one of the first i i just really was connecting to it at the time that we recorded it and it was one of the first songs that we that we attacked when we were in the studio and we kind of like hit a bit of a snag like we we it was feeling really good. And then we listened back to it and I was like, this isn't quite what I had envisioned. And I talked to Matt about it and we were kind of like, yeah, I don't know. So I, I think it was actually a really cool version of it, but it was more like a, uh, it was more experimental. It felt a bit more like yeah. disco or something. And then okay. after a few weeks or not after a few weeks, after a few days, I was like, I wouldn't mind taking another run at that song. So we we went back for a sort of another uh, recording. And Underwater wasn't the only song that we did that on, and we had the time to sort of go back and and do that stuff to a certain extent. So um, it was nice to revisit it with a different outlook, with a bit more um, information and and a sort of open attitude to see what we came up with. And and the result was this sort of slowed down, much more mellow. Um, and then we started to add things in like the horns and the strings and that all felt like it really came together in a, in a nice way. And, um, I loved being in the studio for days like that because it just taught me so much about, uh, the technical side of making music, but also the collaborative side and, and, you know, sort of trying to listen to your instincts and, and bring your instincts to the table without forcing them around, yeah. throwing them around. And, and I was so grateful to have Matt as a producer because he was, you know, he's a friend of mine and, and such a, a, an easy collaborative energy. And um, so, yeah, I, that one for many reasons sticks out to me, but I also just, I like the way it sounds. Yeah. That's so funny. I can't picture underwater as a disco song at all. <laughs> yeah. I was picturing myself with like, you know, roller skates on yeah. Scooter's Roller Palace, just yeah. whipping around. Well, maybe your next album, you can do a disco inspired album and have it take place at the roller rink. I think that would be very successful. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you mentioned that underwater really means a lot. Are there any particular lyrics either in that song or in any of the other songs that are particularly meaningful? I know there's a lot of themes here, falling in love, struggling with LA. Yeah. Um, any lyrics you could identify that you know have particular meaning to you? Well, I mean, I always felt like, it, you know, the. I find the way that songwriting happens for me, it sort of happens in chunks. It's rare mm-hmm. that a song just comes out fully formed in one sitting. Um, you know, maybe I'll get a verse that way uh, or a verse and a chorus, but generally I'll have to go back around to to find the second verse or the third verse. And I think with Underwater, I had written the first 
two verses and they were just feeling so like, um, I don't know, navel gazy, self-indulgent, uh, you know, woe is me. And yeah. so the first line of the third verse is, uh, there you are, you white North American prone <laughs> to embarrassment. You're out of your element. It's just sort of a reminder, um, I think, and relevant in this time when I when I listen to it now too, of like all of the gifts and the the privileges and the the things that I've taken for granted in my own life. Just the ability to complain about the way that I'm feeling is a yeah. is a is a massive um, privilege that a lot of people you know don't have so uh that sticks out to me now as a bit of a uh an interesting with with some recontextualization and and i think i was linking it at the time that i was writing it you know there's an early lyric uh i'll never be president you know i i think like a lot of people i was feeling pretty um uh i wasn't feeling super hopeful about the the direction of the u.s presidency and i was sort of you know making this snide comment about that on some scale and and the way that um you know privileged particularly white people sort of have this like blustery way of just getting through it is very showbiz related um you know the the posturing the sort of the mask that so many people wear as a as a way to get through and 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 not confront your doubts or or the things that make you unsure or uncomfortable, um, you know, that, and it'll feel like you're walking on water. It's, but it's a lie. You're, you know, you're not. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that one, that one certainly, you know, stays with me and I'm, I'm glad that we got a, a recording of it that, uh, but I, I think I, I wanted to put that song out as a single, but yeah. it felt a little too, uh, it felt a little too down for, for you know where the world was at and uh, yeah so instead we put out hold on right <laughs> which is a little more solidarity based i think <laughs> yeah for sure so there's a i feel like in your new album there's kind of a lot of different styles mixed into one you know depending on the song um how would you describe your musical style boy that's a great question i um I don't really know because I think that they're so that like there, there is something about them that each one feels, you know, a little bit like it's in a different style. Uh, yeah. To me, the songs feel like they're in their own style. They're in their own little containers. And sometimes it's, I mean, like I could group say honesty and American roads as like, you know, driving up tempo. Yeah. Roll songs, but for sure. it's harder to pinpoint the, or Matt Barber would call like my acoustic guitar finger picking songs. He'd call them like dusty old folk tunes, <laughs> which I really enjoyed. I was like, maybe I should just record all the dusty folk tunes and put them on their own song called dusty old folk tunes. There you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that probably that comes in a way from um, again, from, from being an actor and, and, you know, uh, characters are very sort of, uh, point of view based, you know, if you sort of step into the shoes of a different character, you have to take a look around at what their given circumstances are, who their uh, relationships are with, how they relate to other people in different circumstances. And I feel the same about these songs. I, you know, I come at them depending on the day or the time of year or, or whatever conversation I've just come out of with um, a set of given circumstances. And I kind of take the song from that perspective so on a day where I'm feeling you know great and and like anything is possible then you know a song like honesty comes out and when I'm feeling like you know uh down and like uh like I've been you know uh somehow my my the my inner workings have been called into questions yeah. and then I then I get songs like heroes and ghosts so I, it's hard to pinpoint but I would say you know, I draw a lot of musical inspiration from the singer songwriters of the seventies. And, yeah. um, so, you know, my partner, Claire told me the other day that my, my music, and I think she meant this as a compliment that my music pays very little attention to trend, which, uh, I, I think is nice. Cause I, yeah. I, I agree. I'm not, you know, any of my friends will tell you I'm not the trendiest guy or the most up to date, but, uh, 
but I don't know. I mean, they kind of come out of that. I, I try to approach these songs from a, from a place of honesty and, and authenticity and try to see how they fall off the truck basically. And then, uh, um, yeah, it's hard. and then assign a genre afterwards, which I would say yeah. probably like in the folk rock yeah. region, but I don't know. It feels cheap to put a label on it. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> um, so you've been in show business a while. Um, when did you start writing music, though? I think probably I start. I mean, my mom would say that I've been writing music my whole life. I I started uh, playing the piano probably when I was about five. And um, and instantly had a, a fascination with coming up with melodies and you know writing down. She would write down uh, little melodies that I had come up with. And I think at one point I was uh, entered into the Kiwanis Festival uh, um, composition competition. And I can't remember if I if I came in third or something. I feel like probably I I was I was in and around the top three at the ripe old age of eight in the Toronto <laughs> Kiwanis Festival for whatever that means. But um, I think probably when I started writing songs was um, was when I was at the National Theatre School of Canada. Cool. And um, I had brought my piano with me out to Montreal when I moved out of my childhood home. And uh, I was living alone, you know, for the first time. And, uh, and you know with an incredible group of people in my uh in my class and year that year and at that school we were always encouraged to be you know bringing whatever we had to the table if you if you could juggle then you know that's a thing that somebody might hire you for so how do you incorporate that into your own creative process and um certainly i think in our second year there there was a lot of like self work being generated we were encouraged to write um you know, little pieces of theater, solo shows for ourselves, um, you know, very, all kinds of little assignments and projects that had to do with creating things. And I would notice that a lot of my creative process would be sort of funneled musically. And I think I started writing little songs from characters' perspectives and as a way to sort of, you know, get in touch with what their world might be like and access it from a different side. Um, and then I think I kind of, you know, started applying that to my own life a little bit in the years that followed and saying, hey, what if I'm the what if I'm the character uh, and this song is about something that I'm going through or even something that I'm imagining, you know. Um, but uh, but so, yeah, I mean, they all the, I, I'd say I probably started in my early 20s, actually, okay. um, you know, writing songs and, and putting them down. And then eventually, you know, my mom was like, what are you doing with these songs? Both my parents really were like are you going to record these things? And I was like, no, I don't want to record them. They'll, <laughs> they'll go away. And they were like, you know what? They'll go, they'll really go away if you don't record them and then you'll have no record of them. So I'm yeah. really glad that they pushed me to do that. And, and that uh, Matt Barber came on and, and agreed to produce both of my records. Cause they're, they're definitely the, the biggest uh, creative outlet that I have. Yeah. Great. So um, I know everyone's interested in, you know, your rise to fame and what that's like. So um, I'd love just kind of a fun question. Um, what's your craziest fan story? <laughs> oh, my craziest fan story. You know, I wrapping my head around fandom at all is very difficult. Uh, yeah, I, I bet. I don't I don't understand it. I mean, I do on, on a level like I'm a I'm a fan of uh, of Toronto sports teams mm -hmm. uh, pretty significantly. So I do understand that you know when somebody really appreciates something, you go in hard, and I I get that. But I it's it's very interesting. I mean, I'd say probably the craziest thing was, um, and this has been a repeat thing, is when when uh, when the cast of Shit's Creek was on our on our uh, live show tour, the up close and personal tour, and we would come out dan and eugene would would walk out on stage and it would be like the beatles and the pope were there at the same time and everybody was just like these rooms full of theaters full of thousands of people just losing it and uh and then one at a time dan would call us out and we'd walk out onto the stage and people would just like i mean obviously Catherine o'hara would get the the <laughs> the craziest ovation but it's a it was just a very surreal feeling to be like walking out to that level of uh of adulation and 
Um, I think it wasn't until those live events that I sort of realized what the the following of the show and how passionate the fan base was and and how much the show uh, you know meant to people and um, how much it contributed to people's lives and and that they wanted to pay that back in some way or, or let us know that it was um, that meaningful to them. So, you know, I mean, little individual things here and there jump to mind, but really it's the, it's the big, the big rooms that, um, yeah, that are, that are the most overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. I was at the Detroit up close and personal and oh, I can man. say for sure that crowd was passionate. That's that great. Was, that's wild. That was one of the biggest places that we went. The, yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, Masonic Temple. That's yeah. an incredible building. Like, uh, yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so some people may know, some people may not. You were a child actor um, playing very notably Mr. Franklin the Turtle. Yes, um, so what was the experience like as a child actor? Did you, you know, were you old enough to process what was going on? Um, did you realize you were becoming famous or just what was that whole experience like? Well, I... Um... I knew that there was, I mean, it was something that I'm sure my parents did not want me to do uh, because it was a bit of a hassle for them. And they were yeah. trying to navigate their own careers and then have to like deal with me as a child being like, I want to perform. <laughs> uh, but they were very good about it. And, and, you know, they're both visual artists. And, uh, and so they were like, okay, well, you know, I guess we'll, we'll see how this goes and we'll, we'll, we'll do it as much as you want. Uh, and so, like, I did, you know, um, I did some plays. I did uh, Beauty and the Beast in Toronto where I played Chip the Teacup for mm -hmm. several months until I outgrew the costume and then uh, did a couple of commercials. And Franklin was was one of the earliest uh, voice gigs that I did and, and became a real sort of staple of, of my life as I went once a week to record the, the episodes. Uh, I didn't, I don't think I had much of a concept of, like, you know, fame or anything. Um, but I think that was in a way the benefit of starting in the theater and animation because my face by and large wasn't, uh, you know, outside of like a Raisin Bran commercial, it wasn't out there. People yeah. at, with, that I went to school with sometimes would yell, hey, Raisin Bran boy. And I'd be like, okay, well, that's fine, I guess. Uh, and, but that was like the extent of it, you know, not even that many people knew about Franklin. I knew that it was... Um, I knew that it was very like a, a a special, especially as a Canadian. Like I read the Franklin the Turtle books growing up, um, and it's such a a beautiful book series that I I I knew I was, you know, part of something that was going to be uh, hopefully like a, a a lasting impact on yeah. you know younger people and lessons about growing up and stuff. And I I thought that was pretty pretty great but i i don't know that i had a sense even that it would that it could be a career i don't know that i thought that i would continue to do this um but uh you know it's just sort of continued to to make itself available as a career so and and i'm i'm grateful that i didn't have you know more exposure as a kid i think because i think it's a it's a difficult thing to navigate especially when you're just figuring out who you are um it can be uh you know we've seen countless people get turned around by it. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that it was, uh, mostly in the animation and theater world. Yeah. So have they, you throughout your career had any notable mentors and can you tell us a little bit about how they helped you? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I guess in the, in the very early days, uh, when I was at daycare, there was a, uh, a guy who ran the daycare named Duran. I don't know his last name, but he was this incredible, incredible guy, very charismatic. And he would get us all like, you know, like three, four year olds, like up in the playroom or whatever, acting out whatever the latest Disney movie was. And, and that was so much fun. I just remember like really enjoying that. And and he was, he told my parents that, you know, they had a, a young performer on their hands and, and that I should, you know, probably continue to do that. And then they enrolled me in some classes at the local library where a guy named KJ Grant ran a sort of a, uh, an improv group for kids. And he, again, really, you know, mentored me. Um, 
and uh, and you know it was just an, an an encourager. You know, he was like, "You you you can do this." So you know, if you wanted to do this, this would be how. Um, Matt Barber is is the the greatest uh, uh, example of a mentor to me in in the music world. I mean, he he has literally made my music career possible. Um, by offering to not just produce uh, both my records, but he played drums on songs from a broken chair. He mixed songs from a broken chair, um, which is a painstaking process. He, on the first time out tour, he was the opening act and playing drums in the band. So I don't think it gets uh, more mentor than that. And it, in a perfect way too, he, he's never, uh, you know, he's never um, prescriptive or, uh, or weird about it. It feels like I'm just hanging out, which is the best kind of mentorship, I think. Yeah. Um, I've had a, a number of my personal friends be mentors to me, which I think is amazing in different fields of my life at different times. Um, certainly my parents and my sister, I'm grateful to have a, a, a family structure that is as supportive and as creative as, uh, as they come. And um, yeah, I mean, God, my, probably my, my, my agent, my first agent, Mary Swinton, and my second agent, Celia Chassels, both of whom I think have retired, but it's hard to say. Uh, my current agent, Pam Winter. I'm, I'm surrounded by mentors. I got That's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Great. So I'd love to pivot and talk a little bit about Schitt's Creek, if that's okay with you. Yeah, of course. Um, so the first question um, that a lot of people told me they were interested in is what was the audition process like for Schitt's Creek? <laughs> Well, for me, it was, uh, I think they were in the middle of shooting season two um, when I got the sides for uh, for Patrick. And there was just one scene. Uh, it was the first scene. I auditioned with the first scene that, that Patrick gets introduced into the story where uh, David's coming into Ray's office to ask about a, a business license and clearly has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> Patrick's there. Um working for Ray at the time. And, uh, and I just, yeah, I, I connected immediately with the, with the tone of it. And I hadn't seen the show, which was a problem for Dan when he, when he found that out, he, <laughs> he still makes fun of me about it, but I, 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 I intentionally didn't watch the show. Cause I was like, I'm going to psych myself out. If I watch the show and I love it and, uh, or, or if I hate it, uh, I will psych myself out equally, and it's probably better if I don't know anything. I already knew that Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy were in it, and that was daunting enough. So I was like, maybe I'll just, uh, I, I'll arm myself with ignorance here, and I, I'll, uh, I'll just go in blind. And I felt like I could justify that because Patrick didn't know anybody; he was new, so that was okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, but I just loved the tone, the sort of the the sarcastic quality of it, um, the, the banter, you know, the, it was, it was so clear and, and so unmuddled. And I don't know, I feel like at that time, often I was, when I was going into auditions, I was adding a lot of stuff. Cause I was like, I gotta bring something to this that nobody else can bring. I have to, I have to supplement this in some way. And with those sides, I didn't add anything. I was like, well, this is all here. It's really, it's crystal clear. Um, I expected that we would do a, like a, if it was going to go to the next round that we would do a, a chemistry read or something, but we didn't because uh -huh. Dan was busy on set writing the episodes and, and doing wardrobe fittings and all kinds of stuff. So he, uh, we never had any chem chemistry tests. We had met, uh, you know, previously, uh, just socially down in LA in the, in the Canadian gold rush of pilot season. And, um, so I knew him socially a little bit and I, I knew Annie as well. And um, so that made it a little less scary for me too, I think. And, um, but I think I did two auditions. I did the, the, the main audition and then a callback and, and got the call and was on set within a couple of weeks. It all happened awesome. pretty fast. And I was like, Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> but everyone was incredibly nice and welcoming and both Eugene and Catherine already knew my name, which, you know, that was, that was kind of major. I feel like that's a, that's a lesson I take with me now. I'm like, Oh, if somebody has learned your name and they're in a position of power, it means that they think you belong there or something that you're worth yeah. putting that much, at least that much effort into. So, um, that was really nice. And, and, uh, yeah, we went from there. That's awesome. So in terms of the rise of Shit's Creek, you know, it, it, 
came kind of suddenly, right? All of a sudden, everybody's talking about this show. Um, why do you think it's gained such an immense following in such a relatively short amount of time? Well, um, I think part of it was just, you know, word of mouth and, you know, that sort of taking its time to, to you know, make its way around. Um, I think certainly the American market is not used to watching uh, CBC shows and, and, you know, pop as a network was uh, um, relatively new to, to the American audience. So, you know, not a, not a ton of people had subscribed to it yet or, or had it as part of their cable package. I mean, I think that probably has changed quite a bit now that uh, now that this show has, has gained the, the following that it has, but I think it's a combination of things too, that, People needed a, a people need a show that is that is as positive and as as loving as Schitt's Creek is without being sappy or corny. Like it, you know, it certainly leans into its emotional moments, but they're always undercut by this sort of sense of humor that you know plays throughout the show and is really you know it's a it's a comedy at the end of the day. It's a it's a comedy that feels like a drama or it's a drama that feels like a comedy. It's hard to tell which, but um, but I think there is that sort of feeling of positivity and certainly for the LGBTQ community to have, um, the relationship between Patrick and David, uh, you know, depicted as it was, um, was a, a major marker of, of progress and, and positivity and support, uh, that a lot of people don't, I think, feel in their, in their personal lives. And, um, you know, so if people could watch the show and and feel some of that love and support um, and, and feel that they weren't they didn't always have to be watching a show that that depicted, you know, uh, gay relationships as like uh, doom filled or or uh, that it was going to end badly or uh, that it was different simply because it was a, a gay relationship. Um, I think that is a is a big reason um it's a big reason why we have the following that we have and, and, and the show has been able to work its way into so many people's lives and hearts. Um, you know, the billboard that was on sunset Boulevard about six stories tall of, of Dan and I kissing, uh, you know, that's one of those sort of groundbreaking moments that shouldn't be groundbreaking. It should, that should be as normal as seeing a billboard of a, a heterosexual couple on a TV show kissing. But, you know, we've seen that countless times and, I don't know. I'd never seen anything like that, uh, that Schitt's Creek uh, ad promo. So I, I feel like that kind of, you know, advocacy and, uh, and leading by example is, is a major part of, uh, of, of what the show brings to people's lives. Absolutely. I would agree with that. Um, any funny stories from the set? Anything that sticks out <laughs> that you could share with us? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, years of of memories of ridiculous things i think of um the day that uh we shot dan's side of um of the simply the best where he does his uh his lip sync and we drank half a bottle of prosecco i'm gonna say half a bottle might have been a bottle okay um, that <laughs> And he just sort of like freestyled that dance. It was, that was an incredible and hilarious and amazing and emotional day, actually. Um, you know, but we had, I, I had a great time watching him do that because he was in this like leather sweater in this tiny heat box of a set dancing to what he thought was like the radio edit of the song, but it was the long play and it was like, eight minutes and he was like when can i stop he was dredged it was it was remarkable um also days like the last day that uh the day that we shot the cabaret season five finale was a, a pretty special one because yeah. everyone was on set that day and uh and it felt like we were actually doing a play like towards the end of the day we were running out of time and we still had to do will common and we were like oh man we only get like three takes at this we better nail this and uh, so it was fun. We actually had backstage jitters and we we're all hanging out backstage at this theater in Toronto. And, you know, it was, it was pretty, uh, that was a pretty remarkable day. Um, I also really loved um, being in the tree line 
uh, when we did the uh, the ropes course episode, I think at the beginning of season five. Yeah. Because um, that was just Dan, me, and uh, Annie and Dustin. And we <laughs> did like a safety course at the beginning of the day. And then we were up there. And Dan was actually pretty like naturally good at it. And so was Dustin. I don't remember Annie doing much of it, but I was very surprised at how bad I was at the ropes course. Um, and was like fall like flying, like your body is basically telling you, don't do this. Your body doesn't really recognize that you're strapped to the cable and you're fine. Even if you fell, you'd be okay. My body was like, get down from this tree. <laughs> not so that was, uh, that was a nice time. And of course, a personal favor for me, the, uh, the baseball day. I just, oh, yeah. uh, as a baseball fan, I was, and as somebody who, you know, I take some credit for that episode existing. <laughs> Um, because Dan once came to a birthday baseball game of mine and uh and I, I feel like that had something to do with the episode. And uh so that was just a blast to to be out there chewing uh you know sunflower seeds and spitting them yeah. all over, spitting them at Dan uh in his general direction, which of course I would never do now because there's a pandemic. But you know <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um what do you miss most about the set or the cast or the show? I'm sure there's a ton of things. Yeah, I I mean mostly the people. Um just getting to uh to be in the company of of that exceptional group of people and that's, you know, that's not just, you know, Catherine, Eugene, Dan and Annie. That goes all the way down the line of of uh Dustin and Chris and Jen and Rizwan and Karen and John and Sarah Levy. I mean, the, the cast of, of the show uh, over that course of time became so close and, and there was such a, a beautiful light familial air to, um, to shooting on those sets. And I, I just couldn't wait to go to work, you know, and, uh, and that has not always been the way. So uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for that time and, and for those friendships and, uh, you know, uh, thankfully I, I, I will get to see those people again and, yes. uh, and hang out. But uh, yeah, I'd say like just going to work and, and um, you know, getting to hang out between, between scenes while things are getting set up, just sitting around and goofing off. Can't be awesome. better than that. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, thank you for that. So I'd love to open it up to audience questions now. Um, folks, if you weren't aware, on the right side of your screen, on the right side of the video, you can actually type in questions. Um, and we will answer as many as we can. I'm hoping, Joanna, that you will answer all of the questions. Sure. <laughs> That's cool with you. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, Kate asks, do you have any rituals before taping a scene for Schitt's Creek? And what helped you get into character? Hmm. Um, I'd say the thing that most helps me get into character um, has been, you know, putting on the, the, the Patrick uniform, which is like a pair of tight jeans, a braided brown belt. Um, a button down blue shirt with the sleeves rolled up. Of course. I think as soon as I had, and like probably a pair of like Oxfords or something. Um, as, as soon as I have that going on, I know who I am. I know how I stand. I know sort of, you know, how I, how I am in the world. Um, and one of the things that would drive um, Dan crazy, which I felt like was, that was a fun element of our, um, our friendship and and our uh, our on screen uh, situation too was that there was always this sort of game going on and making fun of each other. So I would carry around a, this green apple and just throw it up and down for hours, and then put it somewhere on the set, hide it somewhere on the set, and then as soon as they called cut, I'd go get my apple and start tossing it up and down. And Dan would just be like, "Are you? Do you eat the apple? Are you? <laughs> no, no, no. I, well, I keep it with me throughout the day, and then I'll take it home." Um, and so I'd like to show up every day with a green apple that I would never eat. Okay. <laughs> At the end of the week, I'd have about 17 apples in my There you go. in my uh, kitchen. Yeah. All right. Um, so Mara asks, is it hard to keep a straight face when doing scenes with Catherine? She's got such a hilarious affect. Yeah, it is uh, it, it it is incredibly difficult 
I I didn't have a ton of scenes one on one with Catherine, but uh, but any time that she was in a scene, any time that she entered a room, um, you just never quite knew what Moira was going to do, what she was going to say, how she was going to react to something. It was like you were just on your toes and and hoping. And I feel like I kind of let that creep into Patrick a little bit because I think Patrick was like endlessly fascinated with Moira and yeah. like sort of, you know, questioning her at every at every turn, but just sort of like letting a little bit of that sort of, you know, oh boy, what's it going to be? What's she going to do? Come through was, was a lot of fun. You just had to be careful not to not to ruin takes by laughing, but yeah, <laughs> it did happen. All right. Um, Rob asked, do you have a favorite Moira wig and do you know its name? Oh man. Um, I don't know. I, I like the, I like that pink one, but I don't know what the name of it is. Um, I like that she named, she named a couple of the wigs after her sisters, which I think was very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ronnie asks, can you share your favorite behind the scenes moment from Schitt's Creek? Uh, hard to pick a favorite. Um, I don't know. I mean, right now the, the freshest thing in my memory is, is our last day of shooting, which was just, uh, you know, another one of those days where everybody was in and we were shooting the sort of the, the, the final farewell. And, um, and it really, it just felt like this beautiful culminating moment. Everybody was crying and having to get in makeup touch-ups done and um annie and emily and i got uh um uh, these hats made that said bob's garage on them not <laughs> everybody and eugene made a speech and there was champagne and everybody was hugging it was it was something else that's probably my favorite all-time memory nice all right rachel asks what was the scene when you couldn't stop laughing oh my god <laughs> suggesting the, the yeah. ray photo shoot with the spray tan yeah, I don't know. I I tr I really tried to keep my my um, my my stuff together on <laughs> set uh, as best as I could. I can't remember if there was one that I just was losing it. Um, there probably was, but I've blocked it strategically from my memory. I do remember that that the day that um, we did the 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 spray tan. Um, shoot uh that was that watching dan navigate that photo shoot was incredible because he just was posing up a storm and i had to look sort of pissed off <laughs> um, that was tough but thankfully it was still photos so i i was able to keep it together for long enough to get something yeah. usable yeah all right rachel asks um is everything scripted or is some of it improv um yeah, well, it's all it's all painstakingly scripted with the exception of, you know, a couple of little, you know, buttons on scenes or or little things that just happen differently in the course of shooting. I mean, I'm sure that Catherine threw in uh, a number of little things because that's just, you know, what she does and who she is. And she does it better than almost anybody. But um, I I had the sense that the writing was probably smarter than than my improvisational skills. So uh, I, I kept it for the end of the scenes when when I knew it could be cut out. Emily was always making fun of me for throwing a button on, but I liked throwing buttons, you know? Yeah. What am I gonna do? I gotta occupy myself. Yeah. All right, um, Mirav asks, did you know going into the project that you'd be asked to compose this emotional version of Simply the Best? Or was this something that was suggested after your musical talents became known? So, I think I released my first record, um, Songs from a Broken Chair, in the summer between shooting season three and season four. So the open mic episode was in season four, and I think we had just finished shooting season three. And I remember at my album release party, uh, Dan came, and I could see his glasses standing in the back. And... Um, and so I, I, I had the sense that he, he knew, you know, he knew that I was also a musician and, and, um, you know, I think one of Dan's great strengths as a writer is that he, he writes to the strengths of his performers. And, you know, he has a sense of, of, of what you, what you might be able to do really well. And so in season four, he had written in this, um, 
this episode, but you never talked to me about it. This is a classic Dan maneuver. He never discussed it. He just sent the script. I was like, okay, all right, here we go. So yeah, we, we it hadn't been sort of, um, certainly hadn't been planned when I signed on to the show, but uh, it was uh, it was definitely an opportunity um, thrown my way that uh, that I I did not want to mess up and uh, and yeah, I mean I think it's rare that you get that kind of freedom to interpret things on a lot of shows. I know that would have been outsourced and I would have been handed an arrangement and, and Dan really gave me the the space and the time to, to figure that out and, and see how I wanted to approach it, which, uh, which ended up being a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. All right. Troy asks, what was it like shooting the deer class of 2020 segment with Mariah Carey? <laughs> well, that was a very, uh, strange and amazing moment. Um, pretty, uh, pretty interesting to get that call. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a bizarre afternoon of all of us sort of in character, um, you know, staring into our laptops and <laughs> trying to remember what our characters were like. But, uh, you know, anytime you get to sing with, uh, the incomparable Mariah Carey, it's, yeah. uh, it's a good day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think we were all pretty psyched about that. Probably Dan, most of all. Yeah. All right. Maggie asks, can you share the story behind you selecting simply the best to perform? Sure. Well, I, I would love to take the credit, but uh, I think that had always been a, a song that that Dan had a, a, a notion about. He's spoken a few times about, you know, being the person on the dance floor at whatever party and being like, no, you guys listen to the lyrics. <laughs> and, uh, and it's true. I mean, I really think when, as soon as I, 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 I likely wouldn't have chosen that song. Um, but, uh, but I'm glad that he did because as soon as I sort of started digging into it a little bit, I was like, Oh yeah, there is, there is an actually a, a really beautifully crafted love song, um, in, in these lyrics and, uh, and in this melody and, and especially when it turned towards, you know, um, those characters and what it meant for them um, in that moment of sort of, you know, trying to expand their business, but also a, a public proclamation of love and how uncomfortable it was going to make David. I just, I wanted to make sure that that it honored um, all of those things and was a different enough take on the song that, that you know, we hadn't heard before. So, um, you know, took some time figuring out how to how to sort of keep the drive of the song alive. Cause I think that the tempo of that song is important. Um, you know, it didn't feel, it, it felt like the structure was built into the song and it needed to have some, some rhythmic um, quality to it, but it also wanted to feel lyrical and probably a little more sensitive than the, than the Tina version, which is like an all out pop anthem. So, uh, yeah. So it was fun to try to try to walk that line a little bit and uh, see what I could come up with. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Nancy asked, who or what has been your biggest inspiration through your career? <laughs> I can see the uh, the end of that. Question. Yes. That's the uh, that's amazing. A lot of people have um, a lot of people have have walked down the aisle or or had a first dance to this song and that's yeah that's pretty amazing the first part of the question was who's my biggest inspiration can we pull right? up the question again i got distracted i was uh <laughs> distracted by flattery um who or what, what has what been your biggest, biggest inspiration, inspiration through your career? career okay um I don't know. I think that's, that's shifted, uh, from time to time. Um, but I've always been drawn to, uh, artists who are uniquely themselves and, and who are able to shape shift within that definition a little bit. Um, people who come to mind, you know, musically, somebody like Tom Waits, um, or Bob Dylan, you know, those are probably my two, musical guys, songwriter guys, performance guys that I say, you know, that those two voices, they really, they changed throughout their careers a lot, but they were always being themselves in some, some version of it, you know? Um, and I think, you know, similarly with actors, somebody like um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who, mm -hmm. you know, is, there's always some element of him shining through it, but he's also able to sort of 
you know, turn it a little bit towards, you know, whatever the part is and, and come at it with a little bit of, a little bit of strangeness and a, and a lot of, uh, a lot of heart and soul and guts. So I, I, you know, even in the visual art medium, I, I sort of appreciate that the, the, the darker, um, underbelly of of what's going on you know beneath the surface i I've, I've always uh i've always appreciated that and that's something that's sort of you know certainly alive in my dad's work and uh my mom's work is probably a little more serene which uh which i appreciate in equal measure so um yeah i mean uh, new new inspirations every day really uh depending on what i'm listening to or looking at great um, Justin asks, the series ends with Patrick and David staying behind in Schitt's Creek. Do you see any possibility of a spinoff? <laughs> uh, I think we get this question a lot from people who uh, want want there to be more. And yeah. uh, I count myself among them. I, I would I would love nothing more than to revisit these characters if it was if it was right in any way. Um, you know, it's a tough thing, though. Spinoffs are you know, they don't always work and you certainly don't want to diminish the, the, uh, the, the things that have worked about the show and, and the, the level of quality that, um, that the whole team is able to bring to it. And so I think probably, uh, you know, in the hands of, of Dan and Eugene, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be able to figure out if there's a, an appropriate way to, to, to bring something back or, or to move the, the story on in some way. Um, I'd certainly be open to it uh, just because I, I love the show and I love the people so much, but uh, probably thankfully for everybody, I, I don't hold the cards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We probably have time for about two or three more questions. Um, Tony asks, looking ahead, how do you see yourself pushing your boundaries as a musician and as an actor and which excites you more? Huh? Yeah, that's uh thanks, Tony. That's a question that I, I ask myself, uh, a lot. I think that, you know, increasingly I, I, there are opportunities for, um, there to be some crossover between my music and, and my acting life. And I think that's, you know, um, it's interesting and it's, and it's dangerous. Uh, I, I personally, I, I've always kind of wanted to keep those things separate, but I can see how they overlap in so many ways. And, um, so I think probably I'll, I'll, I'll try to be, um, strategic enough in, in both worlds to, to allow each path its own integrity, but, um, but certainly be open to, to cross over when it feels appropriate. Um, you know, now that touring is not really, a a, a doable thing for the, for the immediately foreseeable future, um, certainly, you know, looking at writing more and, and trying to get back in the studio. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I hope sort of like with the, the Gemini notion that I can sort of have these parallel, uh, reflecting lives that I can sort of, you know, if, if one leg gets a little tired, I'll hop onto the yeah. other and, uh, you know, see how I can achieve balance that way. Awesome. All right. Do we have another question? Um, Nina asks, are there any movies or shows you're currently working on? Well, nothing I can really, uh, nothing I can really talk about, but hopefully something, uh, hopefully something interesting to do in, uh, in the, in the next little while. And, um, in the meantime, just sort of, you know, trying to, trying to write some new songs and, uh, and get, I'm, I'm getting married, uh, shortly. So that's taken up Congratulations. Most, of my, most of my energy. That's the, that's the show I'm really focusing on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we have time for one more. Um, so Justin asks or says, congrats on your engagement. <laughs> when is your big day? Thanks, Justin. I'm going to keep that to myself, but I, uh, I appreciate the interest. <laughs> All right. Well, Noah, thank you so much for joining us. We, we're so excited to have you. And everyone um, on YouTube Live, thank you so much for joining us as well. It's been great to talk to you, Noah. Any last final words before we sign off? No, oh, just that this has been a real pleasure. And uh, thanks for having me. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Absolutely.